Uh, I'd just I'd like to thank everyone for, for allowing me to speak here today, um, and particularly Andy, because Andy's been really fantastic for, for me and, and giving me the chance to speak to people. Um, kind of what I want to speak to you about is my own personal experience and the journey that I went on. I'd, I'd like to just kind of say again that it, it's, it's an honour for me to, to speak to you today, um, particularly because it's almost exactly one year ago this week since I tried to take my own life. Now it's kind of a strange thing to hear and to be honest with you it's still a strange thing for me to, to say out loud. Um, but it's, it was kind of something that I was really incredibly ashamed of and, and something I was really embarrassed to admit. But I'm not anymore. You see, I didn't choose to get depressed. And it wasn't something I'd ever even considered. It's not something that ever crossed my mind that I would be depressed. It certainly wasn't anything that crossed my mind that one day I'd try to kill myself. But depression got to me without me having a single say on the matter. It kind of snuck up and it pulled me under. We've all seen those films when there's someone in the water struggling to reach the surface and you're watching it and you're panicking with them and you're almost holding your breath and you're panicking, dying for them to get to the surface and reach the surface and take that gasp of breath. For me, that's what every single day felt like. Every single day I was struggling and I was barely keeping my head above the water. I felt like I was suffocating. And that's the kind of feeling that, that depression has on you, it's, it's the des desperation. I couldn't think straight. I had thousands of thoughts going round my head, each as loud as each other, and I couldn't channel them. I was numb, and I knew that I should be feeling things, but I just couldn't feel it. I'd go to the Everton game, and I just couldn't enjoy it. To be fair, that's quite normal for that at Everton game. <laughs> but I couldn't even get angry at them. I'd sit there and I'd say, you love this. Why aren't you enjoying it? And I knew that I should, but I just couldn't feel anything inside. And that would make me angry and it'd be the same for people and things. I knew I loved them, but I just couldn't feel it. And that would make me feel angry and that would make me feel guilty. And then I'd start to blame myself and it would pull me more and more into that depression. And then I started to, to kind of live a lie. I started to lie to people, uh, lie about what I was feeling, lying about what I liked, lying about how I felt. And the more I lied, the more I hated myself. The more I hated myself, the more depressed I came. I couldn't bear the sound of my own voice. I couldn't bear to look at myself in the mirror. And it was, I've, I've genuinely felt that my presence was making people's lives worse. I thought if I was to end it all, it would be the best possible thing for everyone involved. And that's kind of where I can see two arguments. People often say about suicide that it's a kind of, it's a selfish act and how can you do that? You're leaving people behind and you're ruining their lives and, and things like that. And, and I can kind of understand what you're saying, but for me, who was in that situation, who made that choice to try and kill myself, it was almost a complete opposite. It was almost a selfless act. I genuinely thought I would be doing good. So I tried to do it or at least I tried to. I took what I could find and I, and I tried to cut my wrists. You see, the thing about depression is that it takes over your mind and it convinces you. It convinces you that your thoughts are the right ones and it convinces you that you're the enemy and it convinced me that I had to kill myself. And as I was cutting my wrist, I was interrupted by a couple of kids who ran past. And it stopped me in my tracks and it kind of almost brought the old me back and it, it gave me, for a split second, a little bit of dignity back. 
because I didn't want them to see what I was doing. I didn't want them to know what was happening. And it made me kind of stop and, and look at what I was doing. And it was then that I found that I was waking up and realised exactly what I was about to do. Ladies and gents, I've never been more grateful for a couple of noisy kids than I was that day. Because it was then that I was found and it was then that I was taken home. And it was later that night after I was bandaged up and the police came to visit me and everything that I kind of realised that everything I'd been hiding, all those feelings that I was suppressing, that I was embarrassed to talk about, were out there now. And they were out in the open and people were, were aware of it. And it's a really strange time for me because I was still really ashamed of it. I was ashamed of what I'd just done or what I'd attempted to do. And I only told like my parents and my girlfriend and I begged them not to tell anyone because I didn't want anyone to know about it. And I was kind of scared what people would think if they found out and I was scared that I'd be judged. And really when you look back at it, I was beginning to kind of start my recovery then, but I would never be able to fully recover while I was carrying the burden of guilt and the secrecy. Before I knew it, kind of word had started to get out and rumours had started. And I was noticing things circulating on Twitter and stuff and people were kind of making jokes and using it against me. And I think if that would have been a month before, it might have pushed me over the edge. But I'd come so far already that I thought, it's now or never. So I made the decision, which was probably the best decision I've ever made in my life. And I went on Twitter and I announced to everyone what I'd done. I announced to everyone that I had suffered from depression and I announced to everyone that I tried to kill myself. And I've never been so overwhelmed by anything in my life than I was that day by the response. And it wasn't so much by the people who were wishing me well, but it was the people who came to me and told me that they'd suffered themselves. It was on the first day, 50 people messaged me, all men, saying they'd felt the same way that I had. And they all thought they were alone in thinking it. The next day there was more, the day after that there was more. And I remember clearly feeling free I felt like after I'd announced that and after that response from people, I felt like I could breathe. I felt like I could actually take a deep breath and I could feel it in my lungs. I remember I, let, I met someone later on that night and um, we went for a pint and he'd known what I'd just said on Twitter and he said to me, bad day. And I said, no, to be honest, it's probably one of the best days of my life because my issues were out there and I was talking about them. And for me, as a result of doing that, I was addressing them head on. And by talking so openly, I was getting the therapy that I needed and the support from everyone around me. It was therapy that I wasn't prepared to accept. I went to see a counsellor. I lied to the counsellor. I just told her what she wanted to hear. I dreaded going because I thought, oh, I'm going to have to put up with this again. And I told her everything that she wanted to hear and she discharged me a week before I tried to kill myself. That's not her fault. That was me not being comfortable in, that, in them surroundings. But after all this, it was then that I started to believe that maybe my life had meaning after all and maybe I had a purpose in life. You know, I'd well and truly hit rock bottom, but I was ready to stand on my own two feet again. And that's when I realised that we needed to do more, everybody needed to do more. Because as you've heard today, there's a lot of misconceptions about mental health and about mental illness, and there's a lot of stigmas. As you've already heard, suicide is the single biggest killer of men between the ages of 20 and 49 in the UK, the single biggest killer. But we don't talk about it because, you know, it's frowned upon. We, one in four people will experience mental health issues. But as a society, we don't know what to do. 
we don't even know how we feel about it, so how can we kind of talk about it? How can we respond to it? And this, you know, it's still a taboo issue. So that's what I'm trying to change. What I want to do is I want to talk about it. I want to use my experience so people can relate and talk themselves so they're not alone, but also so people can be more comfortable around the subject. I, I got in touch with Calm. Well, actually, Calm got in touch with me after I announced it on Twitter, and, and I decided that I, I'm going to do everything I can to help Calm and to, and to help get people talking about it. I, um, I decided what I was going to do is going to do some marathons and I'm going to run. Um, ironically, that felt like I was killing myself all over again. But you know, I, I'd, I'd done it, I put myself out there because I thought I want to be outside my comfort zone, I want to do something to raise money. So I raised a couple of hundred quid for Calm and I'm, I'm still doing it, you know, I'm going to be doing another one before the year's out. And as you see there, a local paper picked it up and then National Press picked it up. I was in The Guardian as well, Owen Jones done a piece on that. And then before I knew it, National TV had got in touch. And I went down to go on the Lorraine Kelly show. And as great as it was, because I was on there talking about my experiences and talking about mental health and suicide and everything. On the way back, I thought to myself, why, why me? Why have they gone through the effort of paying for me to get on the train to stay overnight, pay for your food, take you to the station, and bring you back home. Why did they go through the effort of that when they could have gone in their office or stepped outside and spoke to someone who's going through exactly the same thing that I was? What was the difference? And the only difference is that I was talking about it. That's not newsworthy, or at least, it shouldn't be. So that's what I think we need to be doing more. We need to do more to allow people to talk about mental illness and not just people who are suffering. We need to reach out to people who aren't suffering so they know how to look out for signs and how to listen to people when they come to you. If someone goes to you and asks for, asks for help, a lot of us don't know what to do. We don't know how to even kind of commute, you know, so that's what we need to do. We need to normalise mental health. We don't sweep it under the carpet. We need it on the table and it needs to be talked about freely and openly. And that's the only way that we can move forward and we can bring those statistics down. Recently, I've just done a comedy show about mental health. People often ask me, what's the hardest thing you've ever had to do? Without a doubt, it was trying to sell tickets for a comedy show about depression and suicide. But it was an example of how we can do things differently. The room was packed and everyone enjoyed it and, and it was a success. And that shows that we can do things different. We need to allow people to know that therapy or going to a counsellor isn't lying down on a bed and they take notes. You know, there's, there's a way of talking about it publicly that will give you the therapy that you need. And that's why I'm ready to launch Chasing the Stigma. That's going to be a charity that will normalise mental health. And in doing so, it will eradicate the unnecessary stigma that's preventing people from getting the help that they need. It's not about a charity name or a campaign or a logo. It's about a face. And it's about a voice. And not just mine, it's about getting as many voices and as many faces together to normalise mental health and say that it's okay to not be okay. It's about saying, if you're suffering, then I'm here to help. It's about saying, I'll never hold mental health against you. It's about saying, I've suffered too. Whether it's a tweet, whether it's a selfie or a text message, let people know that you're chasing the stigma with them. Let them know that mental health is not their fault. Let people know that they're not alone. Together we can make a difference. Together we can save lives. And all we have to do is talk. Again, I'd like to thank everyone here today for allowing me to, to speak. And 
I'm happy to take any questions and I, I apologise for the, for the video, but it'll be on my website. It was just a, it was just a trick to get you all to go on my website, really. But, <laughs> but again, thank you very much.